I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over this uh, Bygowski paper and then just a little bit of time on the second one. Uh, many of the things that we've already covered in Unit 3.41 are here, so I won't do a, a ton of um, review or going over those again. There are a couple other things I want to point out. There's a nice definition of what a domain is uh, here at the beginning of this paragraph. Um, I, it's a little bit narrow. I think most people would say that a motif is not only things that combine ligands. So other structurally important parts, rather than just ligand binding parts of proteins, are also important. Although this might make up a majority because there's so many of these molecules that are um, serving as um, part of these big gene networks that are mediated through ligands that are moving from one uh, protein product to another. Um, so just review the definition, make sure in your head it's clear what a um, domain is and what its definition is. Um, they reinforce some of the things that we talked about earlier. So here there's talks about how domains can diversify. Um, despite not having a lot of sequence diversity. And then they have this interesting thing about the coevolutionary dynamics that can take place. And we're going to look at that in more detail in the next paper. But basically, this is an idea that if two domains are connected to one another physically somehow once the proteins are made, um, sometimes they're next to each other and then they fold over and interact with one another to make the complete functional part of the protein. Sometimes they might even be domains on different proteins that interact with one another. But if they are, then they're going to be coevolutionary forces, sometimes weak, sometimes stronger. Um, they, there may be examples where there's not a ton of, of, of back and forth, and it's a very loose connection and can be broken up by one mutating, and then it doesn't make a huge difference. But most of the time, those are, are interacting with one another for a very important uh, molecular reason. And so if one mutates and we change and lose it, then very often the other one will mutate or there's going to be some sort of an interaction there. So af as we're looking at all of these sequences, you're, you may be thinking, well, wait, Dr. Terry, just because one mutates doesn't mean the other one is going to. And that's true, but remember, we're looking at data that's made it through millions of years of the filter of natural selection. So we don't see all the changes in one of those that then was removed because it poorly interacted with its partner. We're only seeing the ones that changed and then were able to be compensated for or, or accepted by the partner. And so through that filter of evolution, there's really this strong connection between uh, interacting domains. And so we get coevolution of those domains. Um, and so they go through an example of this that shows uh, at the bottom here how there can be hot spots for some of these that, that change. So an example is this PD7 domain, which was shown only in a very selected set of residues, uh, and it directly confirms this binding uh, impact. So, so there can be some very uh, important specific examples. So it talks again about this thing that we mentioned briefly in the previous one about domain duplication. We didn't talk about mechanisms of domain duplication directly, although we've talked about some of them previously, and you might have some ideas. So you should familiarize yourself with the five domain duplication mechanisms that are listed here in the paper. So they're here in this next paragraph. Let's point them out. One we've talked about, you may have already thought about, is whole genome duplications. Again, we can think of, of um, domain duplication as well. If I just get extra copies anywhere in the genome, even if it's in a brand new gene that's duplicated. That, that's a form of, of m domain duplication also. But really, this is kind of just making extra copies of the genes, so then you can work on them. And, and so then these are paralogous domain duplications, if you want to think about it that way. right? But there are mutations that put them right into the gene itself. So at the gene level, it's still the same orthologous gene, but it has a little bit of extra material in it. So really, these are more like traditional mutations that just change orthologous copies of genes rather than making entire copies of genes. And they are listed down here. So we have four of them that you need to familiarize yourself with. Exon shuffling, okay, which is when exons can be moved in there, again, because of the arrangement of genes in eukaryotes, it's likely that we can get mutations that, that move one exon uh, 
or, or duplicate an exon twice or move one exon into the wrong place, maybe even into a, a wrong gene. But exon shuffling is a mutation where we get duplication and movement of these uh, exon components, which again often correspond to the domains. So when an exon shuffles, you often get a, um, a, a duplicated domain also or a, a, a mutated change domain. Retrotranspositions, so retrotransposons are sometimes also called jumping genes or selfish genes. They're genes that don't have any direct impact on the phenotype of, type of the organism that carries them, but they copy themselves and then sometimes reinsert themselves into the genome. And when they do that, they can sometimes take pieces of other genes with them. And so it's a mechanism for recombination and so can in, t at in certain times lead to uh, uh, domain duplication. Other forms of recombination, like unequal crossing over, um, and exon shuffling and retrotransposons are also forms of recombination, but uh, other forms of recombination can also lead to these duplications. Uh, and then horizontal gene transfer can uh, duplicate this also. Now, horizontal gene transfer, of course, means that we have xenology of the uh, genes that are moved into the new genome. So these other three are really forms of mutation that would just change orthologous genes. Uh, whole gene or whole genome duplication is, of course, an example for paralogy. And then this horizontal gene transfer is xenology. So just be familiar with those five methods. Um, we perhaps could even add a sixth, which maybe is not really in here, but occasionally, this is not as common because it usually only uh, results in very small mistakes, but occasionally you could have an error in the um, DNA uh, polymerase that's copying your genome that it slipped off of the strand it was copying and then reattached um, upstream where it had already copied and then it copies that area off again. And again, most of the time those slippage events in DNA polymerase would result in a relatively small mutation, not an entire domain. But probably rarely they could result in a domain duplication as well. Right, so on the next page here, um, it talks about how we have varying selection pressures on domains. We covered this pretty well in the last lecture, but you can review it. Basically, some domains seem to be really, really common and important and maybe even uh, somewhat diverse, and others are more narrow and restricted and only recur in a very few number of genes. And so the amount of promiscuity of the domains, meaning can they interact with lots and lots of partners, uh, protein partners or ligand partners or whatever their function is, or do they have a much more narrow, constrained range of interactions that are chemically possible. So of course the more promiscuous ones you might expect to see more commonly in the uh, domain repertoire and not only that but they might have a little bit more of a range in the type of functions that they do as they evolve. And then this very last point that I'd like to just remark on is um, a, a reinforcement of this idea that networks play a role in the evolution of domains and how diverse they are, but it's a complex one and a little bit tricky to figure out. Okay, so um, just be aware of that domain interactions across different networks, so this is from one gene to another, those can be important. And then the Jukebeck paper, which um, is, is a very complex, this is really kind of next level, and goes into the, they derive a new method and they go into kind of mathematically the derivation and how it works and uh, uh, probably all of you also, certainly when I look at this, my head just spins and I'm like, yeah, I kind of remember doing a little bit of something like that at one time in one class, but <laughs> mathematically this is beyond what we're going to do for this class. It's certainly beyond my mathematical uh, capabilities. If not, great, more power to you, read it, revel in it, enjoy it, but don't worry about it if it freaks you out. Um, basically what they are doing is they're looking at two domains on the same uh, protein that interact with one another. And then they're looking to see if there is any signal for when, if one changes, does the other one change? Which again, we've kind of talked about and they can looked at specific examples, but they're taking a global big picture view from massive amounts of data. So the idea is that if two different protein domains have an interaction like this, changes in one, particularly in residues that directly interact, are gonna have a direct impact on the other. And so when changes are kept, it means it's been beneficial, that it's gonna ha influence the evolution of its interacting partner over here, and they're looking for a sign of that. And they've set up this metric where they, if they see a certain specific pattern based on this value that they've calculated, which um, uh, they call, I wanna find it here, I have it highlighted. 
you don't need to memorize it. I'm not going to ask you what this metric is, but sometimes you'll go through these papers and they'll have kind of these complex names and they'll have little abbreviations that help you follow along. Um, but the normalized mutual informative measure is what they're 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 calling their measure, and it's way to basically synthesize changes in a protein down to a number and then comparing them across to coupled proteins. And so they're looking at basically the entire database. They pulled uh, their information from this PFAM database, which is looking at protein families based on domains. And then they were able to identify a number of um, potential uh, targets for their study. They, they calculate all these numbers across tens of thousands of different proteins. And then they look to see if the numbers correlate, right? And they can do this kind of visually over large scale. And so this shows that there's not a ton of correlation, a little looser, and then this one shows that there's a pretty strong correlation. If there's a change in one, there's a change in the other. Um, again, don't worry about all of the details of that. But um, And then the last one I want to point out is this one where uh, there is a correlation, although there's a lot of spread here. So although the, t the take home message here is that although these paired domains do influence one another, evolution one does influence the other, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's more of a spectrum. Where on average they do, but there are some where there's very little correlation and others that kind of follow the, the trend, the correlating trend here as we are looking across those paired um, domains. And so it's really a nice example of kind of big data and how our larger data sets are allowing us to take this deconstructed view of domains that we've tried to evaluate and talk about individually and begin to try and put them back together into their whole uh, conforming parts so that we can understand how they interact in nature with one another, with other proteins in these networks. It's a really rich field that is only maybe over the last decade have we had the data available to really, really get into it. And although it's very technical, there are many applications. This is kind of the fundamental way that life evolves and acts at the protein level, at least. And so it's a really rich field and, and, and uh, open to all sorts of new discoveries and useful applications.